Thank you, Hoda. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce all of the panelists, and then they will go in the order of the program. Uh, so first up, we have Laura Schoberg, who's professor of political science at the University of Florida. Uh, she has an affiliation with the Center for Gender, Sexualities, and Women's Studies. And her research foci include gender and security, feminist security theorizing, queer theorizing about global politics, women's involvement in political violence, the disciplinary sociology of international relations, and political methodologies. Her work has been published in more than four dozen journals in political science, international relations, gender studies, geography, and law. And she's author of over a dozen books, and you can find more details about these in the program. Um, her talk today is titled, Interrogating the Image of the 21st Century Woman. Uh, next up, we have Margaret Satterthwaite. She's professor of clinical law, faculty director of the Robert L. Bernstein Institute for Human Rights, and faculty director for the Center of Human Rights and Global Justice, and the director of the Global Justice at NYU School of Law. Um, her research interests include legal empowerment, economic and social rights, human rights and counterterrorism, and vicarious trauma among human rights workers. She's authored or co-authored co more than a dozen human rights reports and dozens of scholarly articles and book chapters. And she's also worked as a consultant to numerous UN agencies and special rapporteurs, and has served on the boards of several human rights organizations. Again, there's much more details in the program. All of these women are so accomplished, it would take me the entire time to read you their entire bios. So we're very delighted they can all be here. Um, and then we also have Brandy Wells, Brandy Thomas Wells, the assistant professor of history from Oklahoma State University. Um, she is a scholar of African Americans in United States history with interest in women's social and political activism. Brandy's work has appeared in Origins and Women and Social Movements in Modern Empire. And she's currently preparing her first book, which uncovers mainstream African American women's internationalism through a focus on the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs and the National Council of Negro Women and their affiliates. Um, her work illuminates how these organizations communicated, cooperated, and competed, and brings to bear how these entities and the members within quilted together various strategies, philosophies, and strands of activism in their quest for civil and human rights. Um, and this project has been funded by the Ford Foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the International Chapterhood of the PEO Sisterhood, and the Ohio State University, among others. And I realized I forgot to give you uh, <coughs> Professor Satterthwaite's talk title, which is Legal Empowerment for Gender Equality. Uh, and then Brandy, uh, Professor Wells's um, talk title is Live Peaceably with All Men, African, women, African American Women's Activism for Peace, Prosperity, and Parity. So please join me in welcoming these fantastic speakers. Okay, I'm a mover, so I'm going to come down here. Um, is this too loud or no? No, I think you're good. Okay, just a second. So the title of my talk is Interrogating the Image of the 21st Century Woman. And the reason that that's the title is because there has to be a pessimist in the room about gender equality, right? <laughs> so I think that's me. Um, not against gender equality, so don't have that sound bite on Twitter because that wouldn't be very much fun. Uh, but I do want to problematize some of the ways in which gender equality is being talked about in kind of progressivist 21st century politics. Particularly, I see three major problems that remain and are even being entrenched that I want to talk about kind of briefly in turn. Um, so I'm going to give you a roadmap and then we're going to talk about them. So the first thing I want to talk about is the way in which this gender equality that's being distributed is being unevenly distributed. The second thing that I want to talk about is that the image of the woman who merits equality is a particularly narrow, narrow and sometimes violent image of a woman. And then the set third is that sometimes women are being expected to actually be more than rather than just equal. Uh, so those are kind of the three things that I want to talk about. So when I say that gender equality is being distributed unevenly, I mean that it's not possible to talk about gender equality without talking about a wide variety of the axes that overlap with gender equality. So gender equality is being distributed unevenly on the basis of race, on the basis of class, on the basis of nationality, on the basis of religion, on the basis of disability, um, and even in different sub-communities on a wide variety of different 
different axes. So you can't say that we need both gender equality and race equality and equality for disabled people and religious equality because they don't exist in universes that are separable. Right, so you can't say, all right, but I'm just advocating for gender equality now, or all right, I'm just advocating for race equality now, or something like that. Because when you advocate for one of those things, uh, the title, the book title that I remember is like a rising tide lifts all whatever. That, that's not true. So that's not actually how it works, right? Um, so instead, often a number of these kind of like single issue advocacy things, especially around gender equality, not only kind of focus on a particular privileged notion of the woman, but they can have in and with them a number of subordinations on the basis of other axes of discrimination and power. Um, so, for example, I study international conflict and often in post-conflict situations there's a rise of the rights of women um, and that's something that's awesome except often that's actually the women on the side that won the war. Uh, and the women on the side that lost the war not so much having a good day. Um, so there's a lot of times that you think uh, should think about the ways in which gender equality movements leave out or often sometimes subordinate particular women um, on the basis of other axes of discrimination. So intersectionality analysis has done a good job of thinking about some of this, especially in the United States, but also decolonial analysis does a good job of talking about sometimes the ways in which liberal gender equality movements are used as a form of colonialism. So for example, there are states that are like, well, we treat our women better than you treat your women. Um, and this is the way that we can look down on you as a state, right? Um, which I'm sure does a lot of women a lot of good. Um, oh, that was sarcasm, wasn't it? Uh, all right, so, so that's, that's number one, is that often gender equality movements uh, don't lift all women equally, um, and there's axes of discrimination on which that's a problem. Okay, then the second thing, which is somewhat related, but not totally related, is that there's a particular image of a woman who is the poster child in a lot of these gender equality movements. Um, and that image of a woman, number one, is gender binary. Uh, so there are things called women and things called men, and this is a settled idea, and you fall in one or the other, and if you fall in one or the other, we're gonna promote your rights, and if you don't, well, then we're confused and not gonna promote your rights. So the very suggestion that gender equality is based on women and men leaves out a significant portion of the population. Uh, biologists advocate, suggest that it's about 1% of the population that is neither male nor female biologically. Uh, there's certainly a wide variety of people who are gender queer, intersex, trans, things like that, who are left out of the image of gender equality as it's traditionally defined. There aren't a lot of people advocating to include those people at peace tables or in politics or something like that. And that doesn't just matter for those people, it matters because when we keep an image of women and men as a dichotomy, huh, okay, there you go. <laughs> Maybe it went with the darkness of what I was saying. Um, <laughs> When you keep this image of women and men as a dichotomy, then you're also suggesting that those categories have a particular meaning in which people must belong. So queer theorists recently have been talking about the violences of inclusion. So when you say, all right, women are allowed to be a part of this particular part of politics that they weren't, say like the military or combat roles or something like that. Um, then you're including people with a particular image of a woman, and if you don't meet that, then there's some expectation to meet that. So sometimes when you say women need this, or to include women we're going to do this, if you're a woman that doesn't fit within those needs or those axes of inclusion, sometimes the inclusion <laughs> itself can be violent. Because it's not the norms that are changing to add you. It's you being added to already accepted norms that were previously negotiated without your input. 
And so a lot of critics of this liberal inclusion model, myself included, suggest that that means that sometimes being in the in-group is as painful as being in the out-group, if not more painful, because you are now a part of something to which you feel like you do not belong. And so there's a question of that the idealized woman in a lot of the presentations of gender equality is, for example, peaceful, um, feminine, uh, often white, often straight, often somebody who bears children or is interested in bearing children. Um, this isn't always and it isn't everything, but it happens a lot. And that actually saves, serves as an axis of inclusion and exclusion that's a little bit more difficult to see. Uh, than a lot of the, well, women can't do this or women can't do that. A lot of my research work has been on politically violent women. Um, and this kind of transitions a little bit into the third point about expectations of women. So I'll tell you that why I got interested in politically violent women is actually, uh, you remember back when there were newspapers, like hard copy newspapers? Okay, so in 2003, the Los Angeles Times shows up at my front door um, and it has a picture of a woman named Lindy England who was uh, the woman holding the leash in the prison abuse scandal in Iraq. Um, and it's a massive picture. Um, and I, I kind of joke with everybody that I'm enough of a leftist that I wasn't surprised that the US military was torturing people. I was actually surprised it was a girl doing it, which was funny because at the time, I had studied gender for almost a decade and still that surprised me. And I realized that to me, the spectrum of thing women, things women could do had widened so much that I didn't actually see that in my head there was still stuff outside of that. And now, like, I'm not saying sexually abusing prisoners is a good thing, definitely not. But I am saying that in my head, I imagined women incapable of doing that, though they were capable of doing everything else men can do. In other words, I imagined women as equal to men, but without their flaws, which is a really mean expectation when you think about it. So this is my third issue, is that often what we say is gender equality places an additional burden on women operating in political spheres, military spheres, and business spheres to actually be more than or better than uh, what we expect of men. So Annika Kronsal wrote a book about how there was an addition of women to peacekeeping forces in the European Union. Uh, and the idea was that if you have gender integrated combat units, men will behave better. Now, so that carries the assumption that women won't misbehave, and then that women will like somehow mother or fix men, and then they'll be better, right? The same way that the understanding that women should be at the peace table, and I'm not saying they shouldn't, suggests that we'll make more peace, right? So like often some of the women who are included in peace tables and things like that are pacifist feminist women not the ones who are out there blowing things up, and there are a lot of them, I promise, right? Like, so my concern is that sometimes there's this expectation that women should be more than. So in Congresses all around the world, in parliaments all around the world, uh, female members of parliament are overrepresented on defense committees and budgeting committees, things traditionally associated with masculinity and they're underrepresented on education social service committees, um, which suggests that when you run for office as a woman, you have to prove that you're as much of a man as the men are, but then you also know you have to prove that you're feminine and can wear a skirt and good stuff like that, right? So in some sense, the word equality, which means sameness, doesn't work. Because what happens is that there's this double expectation of women in a lot of different places to be everything that men are, but still traditionally feminine. Or everything that men are, but come on, they screwed it up and we can figure out how not to. Or everything that men are, but nicer, sweeter. Um, and at the same time, when women screw up in positions of power, femininity is easy to get blamed, right? Like, well, she was just emotional. 
Um, I, I worked for the Hillary Clinton campaign uh, way back in the day in 2008, I guess the first time, right? Um, and somebody, a reporter, there was this day that uh, she had pretty much lost the primary, but not totally. And she shed a tear. Um, and so somebody asked me in my, in my capacity as working for the campaign that they were like, well, what, what is it? Like, do you want somebody who's emotional with their finger on the button? Okay, so first thing, no button, doesn't exist. Uh, second thing, like, as somebody who gets involved in politics, your immediate answer to that question is something to the effect of, like, well, I'm not sure, uh, she's not really emotional, that's it, right? Uh, you know, and then one day, public life a long time, not really emotional, that's the thing. Okay, you go home and you think about it. Okay, let's presume there is a button and somebody's finger is on it, right? Um, would you want them to feel something? I think yes, right? I mean, like, not saying that you wouldn't want them to do, I wouldn't want them to do it, but, but you might want them to do it. You'd still probably want them to feel something. It'd be kind of weird, like, oh, gonna kill 80 million people, sweet, cool. <laughs> You know, like, you think, so gender stereotypes still, number one, weigh negatively on women, and then number two, when they weigh positively on women, weigh harder, right? Um, so the only woman majority parliament in the world until fairly recently was in Rwanda. Um, it was elected almost immediately post-genocide. The idea was what Rwanda needs now is peace. Women are more peaceful, no pressure. <laughs> So this is something that I think is really important to pay attention to, is the ways in which the movement for gender equality creates contradictory forces, that is for some women who benefit and some women who benefit less or not at all, um, but also that the particular image of women may create both discrimination and unfair expectations. I think that's about it for me. Um, so hi, I'm Meg Satterthwaite. I want to start by thanking the organizers of the conference um, for inviting me and for making this possible. I'm incredibly grateful. Um, you'll also notice that I think you were maybe, you had a premonition about the title of my talk because I changed it. Ah, okay. Um, <laughs> so I, I felt really important to talk about legal empowerment for um, in the face of climate change. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I'm absent from New York during climate week, but um, as I'll tell you in a minute, was um, part of a bunch of really exciting discussion and organizing last week that I'll talk about. Um, but before I, want, before I start, what I'd like to do is something that I have learned from um, indigenous leaders in different parts of the world, which is to acknowledge and pay my deep respect to the original keepers of the land where we are now. Um, the Piscataway Conoy, the Piscataway Indian Nation. I would like to pay respect to Piscataway elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. And I'd also like to pay tribute to the stolen labor of those enslaved here. And we know that there um, is a strong connection between this space and our American history of slavery. I acknowledge and offer deep gratitude to this land and water that supports us as we're gathered here together. And I begin with this acknowledgement to ground my discussion in this place and also to connect with who I am. We've already talked a little bit about feminist epistemology. Um, and so for me, it's important to acknowledge my privilege as a white cisgendered lesbian professional in this space. So last week, the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice, where I'm a faculty director, was privileged to host something called the People's Summit on Climate Rights and Human Survival. It was a gathering that brought together more than 200 representatives of indigenous peoples, workers, the academy, environmental and human rights groups. I was there to represent my clinic, the Global Justice Clinic, which partners with um, communities to advance human rights in the face of global inequality. And this is just a, a, a couple of images from our work. Um, in the middle there, 
um, is a demonstration by our partners in Haiti um, who are working to prevent industrial gold mining um, in Haiti. The summit ended with the adoption of a declaration calling on governments and corporations to take immediate and bold action to stop climate change and to ensure that humans and all non-human life can continue to survive on this earth. The mood at the summit was urgent and the delegates were passionate. But the presentation of one speaker was especially impactful, that of Berta Zuniga Cáceres, coordinator of the Honduran indigenous rights organization COPIN and daughter of the slain environmental and indigenous women's rights defender, Berta Cáceres. Berta Cáceres was shot to death in her home in 2016 after she, in the words of the Goldman Foundation, who bestowed her with the Goldman Prize, quote, rallied the indigenous Lenca people of Honduras and waged a grassroots campaign that successfully pressured the world's largest dam builder to pull our, out of the Aguazarca Dam. Her daughter and namesake called on those present at the summit last week to recognize the common roots to the climate and human rights crises, to join together and to move collectively toward a new world where the dignity and humanity of all is protected. She specifically asked us to turn away from profit and toward life. This embrace of life, this search for a new way forward is the only path to peace today since a world united in the quest to save our earth will be able to achieve the transformation, sorry, only a world united in this quest will be able to achieve the transformation needed to get the job done. The failure to take on this challenge will inevitably need not only to climate to disaster, but new forms of war, conflict, and strife, as the haves and have nots fight for control of the high land, the cool spaces, and the remaining places capable of sustaining life. I could not agree more with the urgency that Cáceres implored us to recognize. And I'm utterly convinced that we, every one of us, has a role to play and an important one in action to stop and reverse climate change. But I'm also concerned that there are perils in acting quick, quickly if we do not change the way solutions are identified, formulated, and put into action. Speed can be dangerous when those calling the shots are people who sit in positions of privilege. People like me, as I've already said, who are privileged, professional, and based in the global north. People like me leave behind us a long history of so-called solutions to things that we erroneously saw as problems in the world. Recall that slavery and colonialism were justified by the so-called civilizing mission that the genocide of Native Americans was justified by discourses of progress. That climate change has come about because those in power insisted, despite knowing the opposite, that the industrial North had not in fact created an enormous worldwide problem, one that now desperately does need a solution. The imperative to act quickly must carry with it the equal imperative to shift perspective to see, hear, and accept the experiences, ideas, and solutions of those already living the very real impacts of climate change. This time change must be led by communities on the front lines. People not used to listening urgently need to learn humility, to make space and to support those leading from below. In this vein, I'd like to tell you about the work of two women I've had the privilege to meet who are teaching me to listen and from whom I, for whom I seek to follow. These are women working to advance their rights as women, to secure the rights of their peoples, and to protect their territories, lands that are vital to humanity's survival. Mm. They're doing this through legal empowerment, um, which can really be summed up by um, what my colleague Vivek Maru at Namati has called the ability to know, use, and shape the law. But first, I should tell you that although I'm a lawyer and a law professor, my story is not going to focus on students or lawyers. Instead, I'm going to tell you about two women whose stories are important because they involve women leading their own communities to advance the rights of their people, and how ensuring those communal rights just might save the earth. In my experience, too often, the heroic attorney story comes at the expense of the people who that lawyer is meant to serve. We're all very familiar with grandstanding lawyers speaking for those whose voices can instead be listened to. Today, I wanna to tell you about women who advance their own rights and the rights of their communities. 
And although both women gave me their permission to tell, share their stories, I acknowledge fully that there's some irony in me conveying those stories. The first story I'll tell you about takes place in Guyana, which is a small country at the northern tip of South America. And I want to tell you a bit about the work of a woman named Immaculata Casimero. I've been lucky enough to work with her a bit through my clinic's partnership with the South Rupununi District Council, which is a representative body that advances the rights of the Wapichan indigenous people in southern Guyana. And this is their website, so I encourage you to visit their website if you'd like to see more about what they're um, doing in advancing their rights. Like many indigenous women, Wapichan women face an enormous challenge, that of protecting their ancestral lands, even as they seek legal title for that land from the government. This need to both protect the land and seek legal title has motivated the South Rupununi District Council to organize a team of territorial monitors who are trained to monitor their land for illegal incursions and activities like unlaw unlawful gold mining and deforestation. And this is an, on the left, there's an image from the monitors they collected on their smartphones. And then on the right um, is a picture of Tushau Nicholas Fredericks, who's one of the leaders of the community, who is using the evidence collected by the monitors to advance, um, advance rights on the land. The job of monitoring is not easy. The land is expansive, wild, and includes portions of jungle and mountainous terrain. Because of these challenges, the SRDC has opted to use mobile phones and to capture data and use drones to assess land damage from afar. And here you can see an image of the drone. They actually built this drone um, in their territory and um, also sort of looking at surveying some of the drone images and on the bottom is a picture of deforestation um, as captured by the drone. So I thought about showing you a video, but I won't, but I'll, I'll put this up here so you can see the website if you'd like to watch it. It's a short video um, that explains the goal of this ter uh, monitoring work. And this is Tessa Felix, who, um, has, who for a long time was kind of the tech wizard um, of the monitoring program. And so she talks about how the main goal of the work of these monitors is for the people of the South Rupununi to win this land claim, to have title to their ancestral lands. Um, and to do so, they need to demonstrate continuous use and presence on this land. Um, and so they are collecting images and information that goes onto a map, and that they thus have their own version of the map of their area. Um, and, and so they also collect, um, as I said, evidence of illegal activities under both Wabichan customary law and the law of Guyana, and also, importantly, international law. And then they seek action by the government of Guyana to end those unlawful activities. Um, this is just a recent um, image of some illegal activity that they were able to capture, which is the creation of a water dredge for gold mining in the river there. At times, it's become necessary for the SRDC to seek solidarity and support from international partners, like my clinic, and also from the United Nations. This summer, um, Immaculata Casimero traveled to Geneva to appear before the Committee on All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And this is an image of Mackie, um, as she's known, presenting before the, the, the CEDAW Committee. There she explained the pressing concerns she traveled to Geneva to convey. Here's a brief passage from the report she presented to the Committee. Wapichan women play crucial roles in maintaining our culture, sustaining our people, and contributing to our community's development. Our women work hard to provide for our families and maintain our homes while also supporting our work to uphold indigenous rights and protect Wapi Chan Wish, our customary territory. The government of Guyana's failure to respect indigenous rights and in particular its failure to recognize and title our land causes our women ongoing hardship. They shoulder the double burden of preserving our culture in a changing climate and globalizing economy while fighting to secure our people's rights. This summary of the intersectional challenges that Wabichan women face was effective in moving the committee to make strong recommendations to the government of Guyana. When the committee issued its concluding observations in late July, the SRDC welcomed them with a strongly worded press release, which included the following passage. 
The CEDAW committee called on the government of Guyana to amend its laws to guarantee the rights of indigenous women and girls, including to guarantee our rights to our traditional lands and territories, to guarantee our rights as indigenous women to consultation and free prior and informed consent to policies and legislation affecting us. The press release ended with a call for the government to, quote, combat the negative impacts of mining, to implement programs in conjunction with indigenous communities and indigenous women, to assist with adapting to climate change and fighting the resulting food insecurity that communities are experiencing. Mackie Casimera's travels to Geneva to present her community's concerns and demands was a profound act of legal empowerment. By knowing the law, customary, national, and crucially here, human rights law, she was able to demand action to make those rights real. Now, using the committee's recommendations as an advocacy tool, Mackie is using the law to change, to press for actual change. This change has already started. Government officials have met with um, Mackie Casimera and other Wapichan women to discuss how to implement those changes that the committee has recommended. Now I'd like to tell you briefly about the legal empowerment <coughs> work of another Earth Defender, a woman from the Warani Nation in, in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Nimante Nimkimo is president of the Warani of Pastaza and a founding member of the uh, Alianza Sebo, an organization created to defend the rights of indigenous peoples in Ecuador. I've had the opportunity to meet her only two times. My clinic has worked closely with the SRDC in Guyana, but not um, with this organization in Ecuador. Instead, my relationship with Alianza Sebo or known as Amazon Frontlines on the internet, um, is not a direct partner, but is instead as a board member of an organization called Digital Democracy, which is dedicated to co-creating tech for marginalized communities, including um, Alianza Sebo and Frontlines. I do have permission from Nemante Nimkimo to share this information today. She's been central to her people's fight to defend their land deep in the Amazon against oil exploration and exploitation. This work, like that of the SRDC, uses mapping and legal empowerment, and it has recently resulted in a groundbreaking victory in Ecuadorian court. And it's in part because of that that I want to tell you about it. I think it's important that we celebrate victories and know that there are, are positive stories. Um, first, knowing the law, the Warani were determined to fight against the government's plans to auction off millions of hectares of their rainforest for oil development. The government had concluded a flawed and rushed consultation process in 2012, determining afterwards that the communities had consented to the auction, despite not having adequate translation, not being informed of the negative impacts of oil drilling, or the drastic changes to the landscape that oil drilling would bring. In response, using smartphones, the Warani community recorded the wisdom of their grandmothers and elders, mapped the forests and sacred spaces, and identified the types of animals and plants they protect as custodians of their territory. This kind of mapping is important in many efforts by indigenous peoples to gain title. And this is because white European settlers conceived of indigenous inhabited lands as empty. In fact, there's an infamous, an infamous historical legal doctrine under which this land is considered what's called terra nullius, empty land or nobody's land, which really just meant no Europeans land, which could be acquired through brute force. These particular maps created by the Warani became crucial to their court case. Um, and they launched a court case against the Ecuadorian government seeking withdrawal of the planned oil auction. As Aaliyah Ryan of Digital Democracy explained, the maps played a critical role in the legal case. They were used to demonstrate context and situation, locating the communities within the vast Ecuadorian Amazon and showing the overlap with Block 22, which was how the Ecuadorian government was considering this land, a particular oil block whose sale the Warani are fighting. The maps were also used to demonstrate the profound environmental, social, cultural, and historical, and spiritual knowledges which are embedded in the Warani's relationship to territory. The sacred waterfalls and fishing spots whose water would be contaminated by oil and toxic runoffs, the burial sites and petroglyph covered caves at risk of being turned into drilling platforms, the ancient groves of peach palm their ancestors planted that could be felled to level ground for airstrips, and the mineral deposits where the jungle animals congregate, which would be abandoned. A crucial part of the Warani resistance to the Ecuadorian government's use of law against them 
came when Warani women filled the courtroom with song. And again, I was hoping to play the video, but it was too complicated because it's deeply embedded in a website. But you can find this, and it's really moving. Unrelenting and harmonious, the song insisted that the worldview of the Warani become cognizable in this legal space by simply stopping the courtroom until the judge attended to the singing. Not only would the case be about the law to protect indigenous rights, it was also about shaping the law of free, prior, and informed consent to ensure that any recognized consent was truly that according to indigenous worldviews. In April of this year, the Ecuadorian court ruled in the Warani's favor, finding that the process used to secure consent for oil drilling had been improper. An appeal was rejected in July, and so the Warani land is now protected. This kind of legal empowerment, the ability of indigenous women to know, use, and shape the law to ensure the future of their peoples is essential in the fight against climate change. As Nemanja Ninkimo explained to the press following this victory, this victory means that our Warani people and the future generations, the children, our children, will live healthy and without contamination and that also means to the world that we contribute to the air you breathe, which is from the Amazon. The peaceful world we seek depends on all of us recognizing that yes, the breath we take here in Maryland or Washington or New York or Nairobi or Mumbai comes from the rainforest, from the Amazons of this world, and that only, the only durable proven way to safeguard the health of the lungs of the world while also upholding human rights, is to ensure that indigenous custodians of that sacred space have legal title to their customary territories and the right to determine what happens within those lands. To do this, we must follow these women leaders within their communities. And more and more research is demonstrating the effectiveness of titling indigenous lands as a climate change mitigation strategy. A 2016 study conducted by the Rights and Resources Initiative, the Woods Hold Research Center, and the World Resources Institute estimated that 24% of the world's above ground carbon is sequestered in indigenous occupied tropical forests. Indigenous and local communities are estimated, however, to hold title to only 10% of their customarily claimed territories, leaving the vast majority of this carbon storing land vulnerable to development via mining, deforestation, and clear-cutting for agro-industrial projects. When industrial development <coughs> beckons, deforestation ensues, releasing carbon into the atmosphere. This August, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recognized the important role indigenous and local communities play as custodians of carbon-rich forests. It's time we all embrace this connection and are, ensure our leaders do, too. Legal empowerment, the ability of indigenous communities to know, use, and shape the law to claim title and management of their customary lands is a powerful tool in the hands of those fighting for their lives and ours in the forefront of climate change. It's also their human right. Thank you. I have Professor Wells. Sorry, I'm not sure this is one. This year, 2019, marks 400 years of African American history. Although we know that the history of this population did not begin on these shores or in bondage, I think it is important to open this presentation with this historical mm -hmm. marker. For it allows us to truly contemplate just how long African Americans have agitated for equal rights, for peace, and just how long it has eluded them. In this struggle, African American women have made remarkable contributions while often receiving little credit and little due. And this reminds me of the title of one of my favorite books, uh, which is a 1982 co-edited collection entitled All the Women Are White, All the Men Are Black, But Some of Us Are Brave. Scholar activist Angela Davis put it this way, quote, black women have had to develop a larger vision of our society 
than perhaps any other group. They have had to understand white men, white women, and black men. And they have had to understand themselves. When black women win victories, it is a boost for virtually every segment of society." End quote. As a historian of the black woman's experience, I am elated to be here with you today to consider this population's plight and progress from a historical perspective. And so I hope you all will not go to sleep, sleep on me and you'll be more attentive than the students in my class, classes when I start talking about history. So I'm gonna give you a few examples uh, today. And my presentation draws from my first book. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Seaman, for that introduction. But just as a reminder, it is a book on black women's internationalism. And it covers a long period of history from the 1890s through the 1960s. And I look at how this population, particularly mainstream women. And so what I mean by that is women who value the mainstream, who want to protect uh, American democracy and who really believe in American democracy and having it sort of live up to its ideals, right? So they see the sort of fallacies that existed. Um, and so I do this by looking at two organizations, the National Association of Colored Women, which was founded in 1896, and the National Council of Negro Women, which was founded in 1935. And these organizations are still alive and present today, and they are still the largest black women's umbrella organizations. And so really, even though this is about the past, it's also very much about the present. And as a roadmap, what I'll do is consider two examples of how women in those organizations participated in nation making and participated in global discussions. But then I'll end with Black Lives Matter and talk about how that movement connects to, but also is different. And then I'll pose a few questions uh, for us. Now I have titled this presentation, To Live Peaceably With All Men. And this comes from Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 18 of the Christian Bible. And I chose this particular scripture because the women that I study were Christian activists. And this is how they intended to live their lives and how they framed their activism. Now, prior to this particular passage, it says that believers were not to persecute uh, those who persecuted them, but instead they were to bless them. That they were to remain humble instead of repaying evil for evil, and they were supposed to be honorable to all. And so the few examples that I give today, but most especially my larger work, will show that the women that I study really tried hard to live up to uh, that call. Uh, before I go any further, I want to make a comment about language and the power of words. Uh, in a growing effort to internationalize U.S. history, we begin to use the terms transnationalism and internationalism. And I want you to understand that those are uh, unsettled terms. They're still highly uh, contested. And when we use those terms, we mean different things. Uh, particularly when we think about transnational or international, we're thinking about the relations of power, relationships between nation states, uh, the movement of people, ideas, and goods across geographical borders. And so in the historiography, uh, particularly on white women's activism, we use the word transnational. However, in the African American historiography, we use the word international. And I want to tell you why I describe these women's activism as international. The first is, um, International can be used to describe activists who were less powerful, who also worked transnationally, and by that I mean across borders. But they are also international because they had international ideas about interconnectedness, international ideas about uh, peace, justice, and even international ideas about identity. Uh, in describing internationalism, scholars of yesteryear uh, narrowly conceptualized this term with the focus on definable outcomes. And that means when you look at African Americans at the global stage and you say, well, what are the outcomes of their participation? You can declare them as unimportant, right? And so that means they are not international. But it also means the same thing for women. It means the same thing for people of color when we focus 
narrowly on status, position, and power. And then finally, and I think this is the most important reason, I declare these women internationalists because that is the word that they use to define themselves. And so in all of the history that I see, that is the word. So my first example I will uh, use today actually pulls from peace conferences after the First World War. And as has already been mentioned, this is a particularly timely conference this year because we are at the centennial of those peace talks. And so I want to think about Mary Church Terrell. And this is perhaps a name that many of you have uh, heard before. She participated in this conference, the Women's International League of Peace and Freedom, and she was the first black woman to do so. And so you may say, why? Well, this organization was new. It had only been founded in 1915 at The Hague. And the purpose of the organization is founded, it is very uh, clear in its title, International League of Peace and Freedom. Um, but only after its founding, the, the organizers begin to look for what they called, and I'm using uh, verbatim terms, uh, the ideal black woman. So they didn't want uh, black women um, from any sort of class background, but they wanted a particular type, a particular educated type. So they were very um, narrow in the women that they invited. And so Mary Church Terrell was invited. And she was eager to take up this invitation, but then the State Department, the US State Department, cut the list of delegates down from 30 to 15. And Mary Church Terrell was only able to remain on the list because the notable Jane Addams fought for her to remain, right? And so she joins this conference of uh, hundreds of women from around the world, and she is, as she declares it, the only woman there with African blood running in her veins. Now, I want to problematize that a little bit because while Terrell and others could be grateful to Jane Addams, Jane Addams, in inviting Terrell personally, sidestepped the Black Women's Organization, the National Association of Colored Women. And so this is what this looked like then, and it's what it looked like throughout the entire 20th century. When black women were included at the table, it was a form of tokenism, right? It often did not consider the organizations that they founded. But Mary Church Terrell was excited to take up this opportunity and then to introduce some more complexity, though she, in her memoir and is often remembered as being the only black woman there, she was not. Mary uh, B. Talbert was there, and she was the sitting president of the National Association of Colored Women, and Addie B. Hunton was there, and she had actually served as a nurse in the First World War. Now, if you look at the records of those organizations, you don't see those women's names, right? And so what happens is when we have conversations about women and peace, we don't see that black women were there in the room. And so as a historian, what I do is I bring together all of these different resources to consider the participation of, of black women. And so when I think about Terrell, who is there in the program, I can think about two um, contributions that she made. The first is that she gave a public address that really uh, agitated for women's inclusion in the uh, League of uh, Peace and Freedom and the League of Nations. And so she said that racial equality needed to be a part of this. But then in-house, she actually got up and she gave an address and she talked about peace from the colored woman's perspective, and that's language of the day. And she ended her address this way, quote, white people could talk about peace until doomsday, but they could never have it until the dark races are treated fair and square. So I want you to put a pin in that because I'll circle back around in just a few moments. Now, after her address, she submitted a resolution to the organization. And she wanted the League to grant its full attention, its power, and its resources to ending discrimination based on race or color. Now, her fellow white American delegates had actually tried to weaken the resolution as they made their way over to the conference and at the conference. But the problem was that Terrell was fluent in German, and they were not. So the translator actually failed to, con to uh, consider those translations, which meant that the original resolution was adopted by this league, and this became its sort of mantra on how it dealt with race. 
Now, to uh, be very clear, I want you to understand that African American women from 1915 to 1975, or better from 1919 to 1975, made up only 1% of the Women's International League of Peace and Freedom. But this did not mean, if we look at numbers, sometimes numbers don't tell the whole story, and the truth is most times numbers don't tell the whole story. Uh, Terrell and her fellow black woman colleagues made a tremendous difference in the league. Um, they encouraged the league to investigate US engagement in Haiti. They challenged the league on its false and dangerous assault, uh, accusations that black male troops sexually assaulted German women. And then they brought before the league the Scottsboro Nine, and they kept that on the actual agenda across years. And so what I want you to think about is just how difficult this task was. These women worked in their own organizations, but then they also decided to reach across the aisle and to work with white women, believing then that they would accomplish their goals. Now, even though the interwar period, and by that I mean the period between the First World War and the Second World War, even though it m lacked major conflict, this did not mean that the plight of black women became easier. Um, in fact, they had to attend to uh, mass racial violence and discrimination within the US, and so they did so. It was in this time frame that the National Council of Negro Women was born. Now, the National Council of Negro Women, differently from the National Association of Colored Women, focused on a national platform. The National Association of Colored Women focused largely on localized uplift, and we really saw that they went more local during uh, the Great Depression. Now, different from the Women's League of Peace and Freedom, both the National Association of Colored Women and the National Council of Negro Women supported war when that war seemed to promise further equality. So they would participate in pacifist movements. They would participate in peace organizations, but they could also be found supporting war, particularly when they believed that it would bring equality. So thank you so much for bringing up the complexity of that in this morning's keynote. And so you may say, why? Why did they do that? Well, black women fought for black men's engagement in warfare because they believed that if black men could show themselves as brave, then you couldn't deny their human rights. They believed that if black men shed their blood, then finally, and perhaps even more immediately, the democratic ideals of the nation would come to bear. And so they supported uh, war. And so we can talk about that in the question and answer, the sort of complexity of that. Now, outside of war, black women in the NACW and the NCNW uh, promoted nonviolent approaches to social issues. Most especially for the council, what they tried to do was to propel black women into national and international affairs. And they said that was the only way that you could affect systemic change. Now, while the National Council of Negro Women is something new at this time, I do want to situate it within the broader tradition of black women's organizing. It is not disconnected in that way. And most especially what it shows is that black women took every opportunity, tried every strategy that they could to better their condition. And so when we think about what they attempted to do, I want to bring uh, into the conversation Dorothy B. Fairby. And if you haven't heard her name, I'm not surprised by that. In fact, the first book was a uh, biography of Dorothy B. Fairby was published just a couple of years ago um, by a scholar, I think her name is Jennifer Scallion. And uh, it really talks about how important this woman was. And she was actually a president of Alpha Kappa Alpha. And so she had a lot of different um, a lot of different training, a lot of different leadership experiences. And she was hand chosen by Mary McLeod Bethune to be her successor. And so she is now leading the National Council of Negro Women. And just as an aside, and I hope you all will ask me about this in the question and answer, Mary McLeod Bethune had to fight to participate in the United Nations 
because there were invitations extended to five white women's organizations and one black organization, just one. And the one black organization was the NAACP. And so what the State Department told Bethune was black women are represented. We have five white women's groups and we have a black group. Again, all the women are white and all the blacks are men. And so she fought to participate and Ralph Bunch and um, Du Bois and others, they actually did not want her there, right? But she fought to be there. And on the floor of the United Nations, she actually had Dorothy B. Fairby with her. Dorothy B. Fairby was a physician. And so what she claimed was she was severely ill and she needed a doctor to sit on the floor with her at the United Nations. And it is true that she had suffered from illness, but she was not ill at the United Nations. This was a tactic to increase the visibility of black women in this international event. So hopefully we can get to that in a question and answer. And so Dorothy B. Fairby, in many ways, is an internationalist. That's how she sees herself. And in 1951, she was invited to travel to Germany to take um, part in a six-week tour. And this was to uh, really talk with German women, and at this point we're uh, post-World War II, about how to rebuild their society, right? How to model this based on the United States, democracy, com community work. And the State Department was proud of the accomplishments of these women. And they really tied this initiative by women, quote, to the best kind of publicity of our objectives in Germany. So it can't be understated what it meant. And so Dorothy B. Farabee was the only black woman who was present. And she became the leader of the panel. Despite being black or perhaps because she was a woman of color, she rose to the top. And the State Department had to acknowledge that and her peers acknowledged that. Now when she came home, she gave many speeches throughout the United States about her work. She actually spoke before the State Department. That's not a small matter that a black woman addressed the State Department. She was televised on NBC. But what I want you to know is that privately, she wrote to the president and said, I did this for you, what are you going to do for me? And so she said, don't make a bitter mockery of my words. I went abroad and I talked about the US and how we're working on democracy and progress. What are you going to do for African Americans? And so this is this sort of sophisticated strategy that these women employ. Now, Truman didn't answer the letter. I have no record that he ever answered the letter. But what I want you to know is that Fairby decided to continue on. In 1952, she was the only woman invited back of that previous panel to go back to Germany by Germany. And so she did this. In 1964, she became the face of the State Department when the State Department asked her to take a one-year tour to visit 40 different countries to talk to uh, representatives who, of the State Department but also to talk to local populations. Well, she was a professor at Howard University, and Howard University said, we cannot afford to allow our professor to go for a full year. So if we want to think about power, the State Department could have moved to the next person, but they didn't. There was something about Dorothy Farabee, something about her black woman perspective, and perhaps even her black woman body that made her indispensable to foreign policy. So they cut it. It went from being one year in 40 countries to being six months in 14 countries. And so she had the power then to shift what the State Department wanted. And if we also think about power, when she went abroad on those State Department visits, in every single country she had off the record meetings with women's groups. And she talked about the civil rights movement. She talked about progress and other things. And so we can get into that uh, in the question and answer. What I want to do now is move to the final example. Because if you know history and you know about the modern civil rights movement, we know that there were many successes. And we can pinpoint the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But if you know US history, you know that white backlash came severely. And the 1970s showed that. And in the 1980s and 1990s, we saw a systematic dismantling of civil rights. Uh, but that same time period that we see this backlash, there is this ideology that exists that racial tension is no more. 
By the 1990s, most people believed that the United States was a post-racial society. They had finally healed it. Uh, at the election of Barack Obama, we all know that the conversation was, is the United States beyond race? Is race still an issue? And so I want to think about the 2012 death of Trayvon Martin, which brought three black women, radical community organizers to the forefront. Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi. And what they did was they reignited a global conversation around state violence and racism. And so this movement, I argue, is vital to considering what has happened and what needs to happen in the African-American struggle for peace and parity. And I argue that it illustrates that the movement is not complete. When we think about the words of these founders, we have Opal Tometi who stated in a Time Magazine uh, interview, quote, that this movement is about an international human rights movement. It is about the full recognition of blacks' rights as citizens, and it is a battle for full civil, social, political, legal, economic and cultural rights as enshrined in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So she harkens all the way back to the United Nations. Now the official objective of the Black Lives Matter movement is to campaign against violence and systematic racism towards black people. And so if we look at Tometi's words and we look at the official objective, I told you to put a pen in what Mary Church Terrell said in 1919, so allow me to repeat it here. White people could talk about peace until doomsday, but they could never have it until the dark races were treated fair and square. So as I conclude, and we're focusing on women and the world, I think it's important to think about the lessons that we can take from these examples that I have given. Black women, I showed you, attempted to engage in the state. They attempted to work within uh, organizations founded by white women, black men, um, and interracial organizations. And oftentimes, they were the recipients of token, tokenism. And oftentimes, they experienced marginal successes. And as I told you, these could be clawed back. And we, we see that now. So as I prepared today's remarks, I thought about what tactics should be utilized? And I hope that we'll, we'll think about that as we think about shifting the paradigm. And I really pose this question because when black women founded an organization that really celebrated the state and sought to participate in the state, they experienced a number of shortcomings. But when black women founded an organization that used confrontation to point out the failures of the state, they were delegitimized and declared to be terrorists. Uh, in fact, the State Department and the FBI said that they were proponents of black identity extremism, and that's a quote. So fortunately, the 2017 Sydney Peace Prize saw past this labeling and this false rhetoric, but it was only a few months ago that the FBI formally recognized that Black Lives Matter is not a terrorist organization. And so I want to think about their language. I want to think about different tactics, different strategies, and leave us with this. Until we have a conversation, a real conversation, about the different experiences of people of color, of black Americans, until we consider or reconsider what is thought to be appropriate, what is thought to be legitimate forms of activism, then how do we rewrite the paradigm on peace? Thank you. Okay, uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, so if you have questions, please come up to the microphones here, um, and we will try and get as many as we can before lunch. <laughs> I appreciate your comments, Dr. Wells, and I appreciate your knowledge of history. I'm going to bring up something that may challenge you okay. because it challenges me every single day. Okay, there's a certain element of the inner city black community 
that is violent. And the people that they're victimizing most is their own people, all right? So we have many of our young men being, being shot, our children being killed. But at the same time, we, we're trying to put forward the Black Lives Matter move, movement to protect uh, unarmed black people from being victimized by the police. I see a conflict there because, we got, because when you have children being shot, men being shot by, by primarily African American men, we're looking for the police to come help us but the Black Lives Movement, in many ways, the, the, the police, I think, perceive as a threat to their, their authority. So how are, we gonna, how are we gonna find a way to, to move, uh, to protect our people at the, at, and at the same time get cooperation from the police? It's a very complex question. Yeah, yeah it is a, uh, is this the one? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for that question. It is incredibly complicated. Um, given the little time that we have, I'll just say very briefly what, what I see. The first is that it's not either or. And oftentimes we create this false binary that we have to either focus on police brutality or we have to either focus on um, inter- or intra-related issues. It's not either or, and I don't think that the Black Lives Matter movement would say that it's either or. In fact, I've seen many of the founders say that there needs to be an addressing of violence within the, uh, within the black community. But the other thing is, if we consider Black Lives Matter and what they're trying to do, um, many of these individuals in the black community, as you said, um, inner city black community are violent. We have to understand that many of these individuals are victims of their circumstances. So we have to change their circumstances, right? And so we can't just focus on, you know, the inner issue of violence and not address the systemic racism that allows that, the absence of jobs, the over uh, policing of these communities, uh, drugs, and uh, the different way in which um, uh, black men are treated in the legal system, all of those things. And so it's, it's not either or for me. And I, I get what you're saying. And it's so easy to just sort of say, well, we can't focus on the larger issue unless we focus on the sort of minor issue. And I think what we will see is that black history, as an example, showed, and we can go across centuries, across organizations, a focus on the black community and a focus on the state. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with continuing that dual focus. Uh, my comment is um, on presentation. Who is presenting who at the table? And in this case, I really do understand uh, one of the speakers speaking about using the indigenous leaders and empowering the women. Equality is not, uh, equally, it's not equally distributed. And from my context where I come from, that is very key because when you come really to even try to educate the women or even trying to really empower them, it comes who is doing it. Mm -hmm. And for me as an African and having been exposed, I'm not even a representative of the women, because their, their comment would be, you are exposed. You want to start fire and take off. We have nowhere to go. And this will be coming from the women, it will be coming from the men. It's like, don't listen to these, to these women who are uh, trying to educate you, because they'll take off once uh, they start the fire. So really, what can, can be done for, for these indigenous women or the indigenous leaders are really empowered. Who is going to empower them? Because those who are empowered, they are not a part of them, yeah. right? So it's really uh, a catch-22. It's there, they know they need it, but they are bashed, and they, it's really a, a big problem. So I would want to see how, you, uh, how that issue can be addressed, and I think it, cross, uh, it goes across three of you yeah. from your talk. Thank you. Um. It does feel like this isn't done, doesn't, doesn't it? Like it's um, I think you've just, I mean, I think you've really given the answer, which is that there needs to be um, representation by groups of themselves, and that includes women within communities, right? And I think um, your presentation so strongly and so starkly 
explained why women need their own organiza organizing, their own leadership, as well as being part of their own community, right? Um, I don't obviously have the answer to this. I, I feel that you really answered it in your question. Um, and so thank you very much. And I would, again, call attention to that. I, I love how these conversations are all kind of relating to each other. But this idea that there's dissent within communities, there's difference within communities, women are, we shouldn't be looking for one particular kind of woman who gets equal rights, right? Um, so, yeah. You wanna go Okay, I used the on button. I think I'm okay, right? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I actually think that it's interesting to me to think about those two questions together mm -hmm. uh, because I, I lived in a community that I think would be characterized as a violent African American community in the south side of Chicago uh, around Robert Taylor. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I noticed was that there aren't police there, there's a police station. Mm -hmm and the police drive to it in the morning and then they stay in there and they never come out and the only time i ever saw them come out was when they saw white people around and they were just trying to scare them away so they didn't get hurt and be in the newspaper right like i never saw them come out when there was like noise or violence or anything like that and so to me the phenomena that causes police to be violent towards unarmed black people also has a very serious role in these communities of violence, which is the, the, the black body as a human isn't being taken seriously in policing, right? So to me, like, I want to walk this line where I don't engage in representation, but I also am not blind to the things I see around me, right? It actually matters that I was the white kid they tried to scare away instead of the black kid they stopped from being policed for or of. But at the same time, it's something I witnessed and experienced and can communicate, right? So to me, I don't want to say I speak for everyone who's left out of this rising tide of gender equality, but I can say I speak as someone who has some issues fitting in with the idealized notion of women, right? Like, which I think is a little different than representation. Thank you for that great question. Um, you really get to the heart of one of the sort of interesting conversations that I have to have about black women and international engagement, particularly as it relates to Africa and the African diaspora. Like I said, when Mary Church Terrell stood up and said that she was representing all black people everywhere, right? And so the only person with African blood in her veins. And so she took liberty to say that she represented African women. And that's what a lot of um, white women organizations expected throughout the 20th century is that they would pick a black American woman and she would represent all black women everywhere, right? And so that's the complexity. But you got to the heart of something that, again, I think all of us talked about, uh, that this morning's keynote talked about, which is about uh, essentialism and the problematic and false notion of sisterhood, right? Which really gets rid of or fails to see uh, identity. And so if I'm being um, completely uh, sort of transparent and hopefully telling you all to read the book when it comes out, one of the things that I have to complicate is that as black women got a seat at the table and they said to the United Nations, allow us because we are related to African women, and they use this notion of sisterhood, allow us to be the representatives of the United Nations, what we see again is a false notion of sisterhood, and activism becomes philanthropy. And we have to really break that down, what happens when you know, women, people of color go into other spaces and they see themselves as working on populations rather than working with populations. And so I think that's a part of the conversation. Okay, yeah, we can take one more question or two more if there's anybody with the, okay, two more questions and then we'll stop for lunch. <laughs> Uh, hello, uh, I am Madhu, I'm a Fulbright Scholar from India, and my question, it's a, I'm very thankful to be here, and it's an interesting panel discussion. My question is to Laura, and uh, specifically, uh, uh, she, you say that uh, there's uh, expectations uh, from this, like women can do anything which uh, like men are supposed to do, or men, they are capable to, and without the flaws of men. 
And when we see that kind of incident or pictures or any, any happening, it is being used in my country specifically I'm talking about or elsewhere it may be true. That incident, like something negative done by women, that incident is basically used as a, to write off this whole debate of gender equality. And there's a backlash, see, see, the, see the women, that's kind of, so how to address those things? How to, how to talk people, how to convince them that, so the, how to reverse this whole thing of this, this notion of gender equality, mm. which is true, but which is being used against them. Thank you, I, think, I hope I'm clear. Yeah, you know, I think that that's one of the big problems with instrumentalization being the basis for gender equality, right? So when you say there should be more women in politics because they make more peace, there should be more women in militaries because they'll be better behaved, countries that treat their women better are better at peace, right? Like all of these things then add the burden of to merit equality, you must be better than, right? And so to me, like, I'm all for these femininity, these values associated with femininity, right? Like, I love the idea of negotiation, of talking, of peace, like all of these things. But I want to separate the justification for including values associated with femininity in politics and the justification for including women in politics. Women in politics should be half of the people in politics, even if they all suck, right? Like, even if they're terrible. And I think the more you kind of say that, although that doesn't sell that well in a soundbite, like the less you end up with the being blamed for women's outlying behavior, right? Because every time a woman screws up, it's like a much bigger deal. So like there's this interesting thing, one of the places I study is uh, gender integration in militaries and combat roles. And so people sell this saying militaries will be more effective and there'll be more unit cohesion if you have women in it. Not true. Like empirically, it seems to be the case that militaries are not more effective, sometimes they're less effective, and there's not more unit cohesion, there's sometimes less unit cohesion. So then people turn around and say, well, then we shouldn't include women in combat. And to me, I'm like, no, you should just like, well, stop combat or get better at it, one of the two, <laughs> right? Like, but it's, if the justification of including women is that things will be better, then that means that every time a woman isn't better, it gets turned on women. And so to me, you have to break it up at the promoting level because you can't really do anything afterwards when they say, look, this woman isn't better, right? One more question, I think. Sure. And it's a very broad question, so do with it as you will. I'll direct it to Dr. Schoberg, but I think um, it has salience for all of you. Um, so in international relations, um, and more generally, I think um, in feminist contributions, part of what's been posited as an important thing, perhaps one of the greatest obstacles to advancing justice and equity for women and for all people is a reconceptualization of power. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering um, if you could share some of your thoughts on that, just I mean, it's a huge question, but then also for the other panelists, if there's time, kind of the salience of that for the particular concrete um, examples and cases that you're, you're dealing with, it would be illuminating. Okay, do you want to start? We'll go down the table and then just quick responses. Or they can start. Or they can start. <laughs> All right, I guess. I guess I will, yeah. Um, you know, I go back and forth on this, right? Because like, I want to take uh, the ways that power is interpreted by policymakers in the international arena seriously. Uh, because like, if I sit here and reinterpret power, uh, well, then I might just be talking to myself and a bunch of cool women, which is awesome. Um, but so partly I want to take seriously the way people think about power in the mainstream. But then I also want to say that you know, power to, that is the power to fight against what's going on in the world, and power with, that is the power to get together to affect change, also really matter. And I think that you can add to that the power of discourse, right? Like, I'm not that good at saying things well. I don't know if you've noticed. Uh, but there are lots of people who are actually really good at figuring out how to frame things such that these discourses then intervene in media and political discussions. And I think that that's also kind of a really important understanding of power. 
And I think for gender equality, it's really important to me to understand that power and violence go hand in hand, right? Like, and that even a lot of the positive things we do have violent content. So like to me, I keep reminding myself there's no such thing as anything I can do that's nonviolent, right? There's just a question of less violence and directing the violence where it should go instead of that there's no power and no violence in what I do. So that's kind of important to me to contextualize. And that's not a complete answer, but we're a little out of time, so I'll shut up for now. Um, I guess I'll just, I'll just say in terms of legal empowerment, as a lawyer, that's the way I, th I think about um, your question, because I think in the US and in many places, the law has been monopolized by lawyers. And I think that the question of what the power of law is is a question about when does the state have the power to act? What does the state owe people? You know, and that should be determined by people, not by lawyers, in my opinion. Um, so the, the purpose of legal empowerment really is to put law in the hands of people so that they can make it do what they want it to do for their rights. And so right now, that's what I'm really focused on. Um, and certainly for women, that does mean rearticulating the power of the state um, across all of these axes of difference. and 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 making those claims in a very um, nuanced way. So for the sake of time, I'll keep my remarks uh, brief, but hopefully we can talk afterwards because you're absolutely right. This is a huge question and it's very complicated. And it's something that I wrestle with, especially I wrestle with and against because in writing about black women in the international arena, what power did they exercise? That's usually the question that I get, um, especially because I present at foreign policy conferences and different things like that. And so I have, um, and I continue to go back and forth, as Laura has mentioned, with uh, how to define power and what power looks like. Uh, and one, I guess, small example that I would offer, um, and I'm calling on the work of Penny Von Eschen here when she talks about ambassadors, cultural ambassadors, rather than just ambassadors that we think about at the State Department, and we think about uh, people, people like Louis Armstrong and other um, well-known celebrities and artists who engaged in foreign policy, right? And so they practice power, even when we don't think about it traditionally, in the sort of things that they said and the concessions that they could receive. So you're absolutely right that we have to think about what we mean when we say power, but to Laura's point, you know, I can't just redefine power in a way that removes the nation state because then I think I don't do justice to really describing the population that I'm talking about. So I'll just say that and then hopefully we can talk a bit afterwards. Okay, uh, if you can join me in thanking the panelists again for a fantastic presentation and discussion.